uh, when everything that um, happens around us is natural, because it must always be according to natural and spiritual law. You can't let your mind run away with you. What you have to do is to keep your firmly feet on the ground and uh, study things from that point of view. Now, spiritualism says that it's a science. And they say that because they don't want the sort of airy fairy attitude towards everything that we see. We must bring it down to basics and realize always that when we are together and we are studying, we must study it always with questions and answers that it fits in naturally with the science says that they discovered and uh, keep it on to that question. So people don't sort of think uh, how one silly we are. So it does away with um, uh, does away with uh, unsung uh, a lot of this nonsense, especially the sharker business that you've got to clear out the way once and for all. I doesn't mean to say that colour doesn't fall through us and doesn't come from outer uh, outer realms, because they do. They come in from the art. I've spoken to you about how the planetary system and um, we affects us because the vibrations from these planets are affecting the earth. They come to the earth. And that is why when you're born under certain uh, signs and certain times, certain <coughs> planets which are operating at that time are having an effect on you because there's vibrations pouring in at that particular time. So the whole of life is a form of vibration, and everything is according to law. If you break that law, then it will affect you. you, you it will have its effect on you. And that is what we have to keep in mind as spiritualists, that we can't ask the guides to remove it. The guides can only um, <coughs> tell us, and advise us, and um, uh, give us power to do it for ourselves. So therefore, if we bring music, and colour, and uh, harmony, and all these things sound together, we realise that that is what life's all about. We are moving all the time. Everything is moving. Even the aura around you is moving all the time. It's changing uh, according to your thoughts. And the more thought you have on a specific thing, until you've accepted it as fact, then becomes a reality to you. And that it becomes a fixed thing. Until you experience something else, and you find that begins to change again. It's the same when you are dealing with people uh, that come to you for assessments. You see the color range there. And you realize that they are at a certain level at the moment. You're moving them onto higher levels. So that you are bringing a change in their thinking, a change in their environment, etc and everything about it, so that gradually certain colours that are what we call down below begin to move up, and colours that are of no use to them, not at the present time, material colour, move down, so that you are in actual fact bringing out the spiritual things. So, you see how important it is that we don't get confused between what is the natural aura to what is the spiritual aura, to what is the physical order, to what is the actual soul order. All these things have to be understood. And they have to be developed according to your development in consciousness. As you progress, so it means that you must be using higher thought. You must be pressing onward all the time and progressing. The problem with so many people is the fact that they're marking time, they're not moving forward at all, and eventually they'll start to recede back, they'll start to move backwards, simply because they're not moving forward, and you can't stand still, because everything is movement. Your aura, you can't stand it still, it's got to keep moving, and so therefore, if you can't move forward, it'll move backwards. So you get a deterioration, and that is why in spiritualism, and mediums, mediums do not usually pass away young. They usually pass away quite early. And one thing about them is that the mental capacity of them is the last to be lost. Usually it's kept at a very high level. 
and you find that they are capable of being able to control their emotions and control their thoughts because they developed in that, that way. And they continue onward. In fact, many of them give sittings when you come to think that the great trans medium, R.J. Lees, whose desk is outside there, one of the greatest mediums, and he was the one that was used by Queen Victoria when she wanted to um, con uh, get in contact with uh, uh, Prince Albert. Um, he was the one that gave her the first thing. And it was he that eventually, because he asked, she, was a, she asked him to go and live at um, the palace so that she could have regular sittings with him, and he refused and said that uh, uh, he, she already had a very wonderful medium, and they didn't know that he was a medium, and he didn't know himself really. Mm -hmm. But eventually, um, he, um, in this uh, state, uh, that he was able to sense that this man uh, was, Ron Brown, a very famous, uh, and would be a very famous medium, and of course he was. Now, you see, when you come to think that the power of that man he was brought in, as you know, uh, to the Ripper case, and it's still today uh, that he, he spoke. And we have some of his letters uh, that would be very, um, very famous letters um, that we have um, that he left because uh, he left uh, uh, um, behind here a test sitting, uh, which I eventually was the medium. And eventually, when the letter, the final letter, was open with regard to this, it was my initials that he was to be given to, and he never met me. I mean, he passed away before I was born. And therefore, he realized it was marked when he was opened up, there were my initials, G, M, and H, and that uh, this would be the medium that would be able to unfold for you the one I want you to know. And that's why we have the desk there in his library, because it was handed to this particular person. And I suggested they were left here at the hall. That's right, they're in the hall. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here you have a very famous man, a very brilliant man. When he used to go to walks in Cornwall, where he, he spent a great deal of his young life, he was always, he was always mediumistic. And um, he, when he was uh, walking to, uh, along the sand by himself, there was another set of footsteps walked with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, people used to notice that besides his footsteps was another pair, and yet he was alone, and he was talking to his guide. And his guide always materialized. Mm -hmm. And um, his guide used to sit, he used to sit on a chair, there's the red velvet um, um, seat, which has the arms that move out by the, uh, that was where the guide used to materialize and sit on that chair. <laughs> very famous show. Um, but what is important, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is the fact <laughs> which are here. Uh, those he didn't uh, write those. He was the only the writer. He was the um, scribe. He tells you that. And he was his guide that told him word for word what to write. <coughs> and so those books are really excellent books. If you haven't read them, you should read them. Uh, Through the Mists is probably his best. But that was written by the guide that um, uh, materialized and used to tell him what to write. And so he wrote it. And when he was 92 and dying, half an hour or so before he passed, the guide entranced him as he was lying, spoke to his two sons and daughter and told them that he was taking his father away and they would never hear of the father again, that he was going to move on to higher work and that uh, they, he would only come and give this evidence that I was the fortunate medium to be chosen to do it and um, that he'd left everything in an envelope. And uh, it was not until years later that I went to the house and eventually found it. And uh, this, it was written all in there, and the guide said, we're taking your father away, his work is over, he will not visit you, there's no need. He's going to go to further work. And he's never had up again, and he never has, he's never appeared. 
<coughs> so therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we realized that there was a medium of 92, and yet could still go into trance. And the perfect trance, as he was lying there, and the father came to, he was in the unconscious state at the time, he, the guy came through and said, we we'll take the father away, we we'll let him speak to you, and he will say his goodbyes, and just came and spoke to them, and just said, I'll meet you when you come across. None of them could But that is medium difference. That is best. Now, when you realize that they've got to be tuned in on that level, it means what I'm trying to tell you all the time. It isn't a question of just sitting there and saying, take the over. It's a question of it being at one with you. His guide was so at one together that they were together. It's the same with all these mediums. <coughs> they were so powerfully developed that they were not separate. They were not separate. They were at one with them. And so they became this close link uh, with their life to the effect that you'd have thought the probably the mother or father or wife that had been past many years would have come to take him away, but it wasn't his guide. You see. It was the guide that said, I'm taking your father away, not his wife. So you come to it that the, the, the contact and the close link is not necessarily a link of someone here. It can be someone more close to you than what you realize. And there are spiritual links on these particular <coughs> vibrations that are there. So you realize, I hope, that what I wanted from you all the time uh, while you've been here uh, is to change your ideas from being psychic to being spiritual. To drop the word mm -hmm. psychic unfoldment to spiritual unfoldment. To look upon God not as a he, but as a universal force, a spiritual force that is beyond all things, that we can't describe it. We cannot give it a six, we cannot call it he or she, because it's both. You see, it's the power flowing through you. And where the Christing comes in, which means anointed one, or sonship, we want to call it that, is because through God, being father and mother, the both are brings the, 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 the female to the fact that a soul is to be born, and through the material context, then the body is formed for the soul to use. It is not the body that's there for the soul to use. It's there, the body's there for the soul to use. Yet the soul comes later. The soul comes in. It, the soul is already there. It has to be provided with the body so that it comes at the right time with all the right forces, the right coming from all the uh, astrological signs, so that the second you are born, that is the time that you're so. Now an abortion means that they've come, the spirit knows that that child is going to be aborted, because in any case it wouldn't live anyway, there would be something wrong. And so it's aborted, but the child, the soul can't leave. Now, I have to put right a question uh, here, and I don't want to think I'm contradicting it, because for you to find out, there was someone that asked the question of the guy the other day, and it was that they stated that the soul came into the body at conception. And that was the words that were used. Now, I'm not here to contradict it, but I am here to stop you from being confused. And that means you either accept that as a reality, or you accept mine, and where I say it's seven months. And I can only say to you, ladies and gentlemen, from the fact that, that and again, you see, you can have these, um, in, in, what one would say, well, why does one say one thing and one another? Well, that's what the guy has found. Um, it is not what I have found. I wouldn't argue with it, because I think we must find these things for ourselves and sort it out and realize that maybe on one level where they have accepted that particular uh, experience, but how can it? Because that means that if the soul is there within the body, uh, there, and it has been aborted, I feel that if it's been aborted uh, immediately, there must be also something wrong with the soul. And yet the soul is perfect and is never touched. And it can pass through several bodies and still come to that final body where it can use it. So we've got to consider that where it is possible 
and you see where you get a seven-month child, and remember there are children that are born, several of them, uh, they usually have a difficulty, uh, but then in very, well, they used to have to be in, in the incubator and all sorts of things with those mums, and yet the child lives. So it means, you see, that the soul is there at that particular time. But before that time, they usually lose. And I think it's because the soul is not there. And because the soul must be there for it to be housed within that body. The body comes before the soul continues, the body will die. And it will try again and again. And that is why parents should uh, after an abortion, unless they feel that they, they can't or the doctor state they shouldn't. Even then, I believe that they should go to a healer or something to find out, or a medium, to find out if they should. And if so, then they should probably have another child because of the soap. If not, it will definitely remain there, waiting, until uh, one of the family, close to the mother, probably a daughter or a son, and uh, the same child, so it will come got to do is part of the law because you belong to those particular <coughs> vibrations. But search for yourself, you see here. And we can only put ideas into your mind. You learn from it. And question the spirit when they come to you. And see exactly what they do teach you and what they try to convey to you. Now I want to move away from the psychic business onto this deep spiritual business. Because I believe that the world is changing, mankind is changing. We are facing a complete new age altogether, which is totally different from the 2,000 years of the past age. We are now in the Aquarian age, and it is the Aquarian age that now is the spiritual age in which we are coming to. And souls now that are coming to the earth are more enlightened than what they were before so that they are experienced souls in many cases. And we are going to have many people that are coming, with tremendously gifted people, who will really uh, bring nations together rather than nations falling apart. And I think if you look at it sensibly, you'll realize that this is actually taking place. And it is the law of the spirit <coughs> that this should be so. Because it is so, then we must help in these directions. So I want you, if you will, to now uh, take it as I want to do, seriously and nicely with you. I have been with the President of the Spiritual Society of Union, and I have been for 20 years, and I'm going to make it 21. <coughs> I've bribed God to the fun, to be here for at least another 12 months. But I believe the next 12 months is a crisis mm -hmm. of all the work we're going to do. Mm -hmm. We shall either fail and have to start again, or we're able to break through and keep this spiritual contact, which I believe is so important. Now many of you will go back to your churches, many of you as millions will come against people when you start to teach what well, I hope you've learned uh, a great deal this week, and still got still more to learn yet, that you will go away, uh, not with fixed ideas you've got to do, but with ideas that if you're going to get go forward, You've got to go forward onto a spiritual level with a goal in mind. It's no use us trying to go forward. We haven't a goal. We must have a goal to reach. And that goal must be to get our message across spiritually to mankind to change their outlook on life. It's not just to give the evidence of survival, but it is also to bring the spiritual change, to turn the attention of people inwards. So that people will begin to try and look at themselves from the inside rather than from the outside. In other words, look at it to what people will see coming from you. Can you understand that? And therefore development must be not to go at all expense to develop your psychic powers, but to develop your spiritual powers. I start off by saying it is the spiritual energies that are important. Now let's have a look at what I mean by those energies. Because one of the <coughs> colours you know happens to be crimson, which is a great spiritual energy of loving. But it also has that reverse of hate. Now what you find in the vision places 
Africa, where religious people very often develop to be very religious indeed, but very bigoted as well, very biased. What are you finding? Religion against religion. And what they're doing in many cases in you know, where there's been another religion, these people that have professed to be so loving and caring, when the real test comes, have not developed to those great things. Here you have an example, perhaps, uh, Jesus probably as a great master of that life of I'm quite sure that one thing he did, although there's always the doubt, I've always had it on my mind, uh, that Jesus, though spiritually developed, I think was a bit communistic personally, because he seemed to me uh, always to be um, against authority and that sort of thing. Uh, each, uh, he always said that it was the um, a God that he wanted people to find. And, and this can very often be, I mean, if you've met some of these born-again Christians, my word, you think that the only people in the world have to be the born-again Christians, and everybody else is evil, you see. Yeah. Now, it does seem to me that that's a very good example. Do, do you know what I mean? Um, so what you're getting is, you can reach the heights spiritually, and then if you're not careful, you can move across by being so envious that you find yourself bringing hate into it, which is the opposite to what you just developed. So you see how sensitive the whole thing is. So what we are doing, ladies and gentlemen, is, in spiritism, we are trying here to build people to be spiritually minded, but developing them so that they can be overshadowed by the spirit that can guide them and hold them at these times. Now, what was the greatest part of the life of Jesus? Was it his crucifixion, which I don't think it was. I think it was when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Because there was the master spirit speaking. Before, it was, Father, why is that to say for me? He was torn apart. He didn't know how to handle it. And therefore he went to God, and there he was going to receive this sort of wonderful uplift that he had, with the guys like Moses and various people that were there helping him, so that he could pass through that particular experience without letting himself down. What they didn't want was for him to hit, because it was the complete opposite to what he was teaching. And therefore the guide came in there. And then he said, right in the last, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they did. Now to me, that was the whole point of his ministry. Because he mastered the two forms of hearts, to love and not to hate. So he held it. So therefore, we have to see beautifully the sentencing. What was the next thing he did? The next thing he did, ladies and gentlemen, was that is healing, he spent a great deal of his time healing. But don't forget that he also spent a great deal of time in meditation. In the Tibetan writings, it states that around the period of when Jesus was on the earth, <coughs> there came the man from, from Palace, from the Nazarene. There came the pet man from Nazareth who came to speak with the elders in the Tibetan Mass. Now that is written. And ladies and gentlemen, when you realize that, and there was this gap, you see, in his life, I believe that he was going around under learning, teaching, being able to receive spiritual development, which he was not receiving in his own country. And he had a, 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 an uncle, as you know, that was a merchant and travelled about a lot, and I believe that's where he had. So he developed a power before he began his ministry. And I don't believe that Jesus was initiated with his gifts until he baptized, he was baptized well, by John. And John uh, was there with the water. What was there? It was not a question, ladies and gentlemen, of him coming down and saying, will you just baptize me? That was not the point. The point of it was 
that he humbled himself. He was so full of humility that he didn't try to master over John. He came beneath John. It was a humility, you see. That was what had happened. And a voice was heard. Now, what was it? Was it a, a direct voice? Was it a, an independent voice? Now, come on, what was the voice? Was it Claire Lord? No, it wasn't. It couldn't be. Because John heard it. John heard it. Jesus heard it. And the multitude heard it. So what was it? Independent. Of course. It was, in the, it was uh, the independent voice, or what one would call the direct voice. And it was from this guy. This is my beloved son, of whom I am well pleased. <coughs> what do the great guys say? Beloved, I walk among you. My sons and my daughters, I move with you. Same principle. So what you got was this tremendous power that he had developed, so that he was spiritually developed, and he used that power. So we've got two notes now. We have this gentleman, Fred. C. He's off colour today. So you've got two two notes there, which I'll use two more. They blend together. So we have two notes now. We've got the crimson, which is all loving or caring. We have the E note, which is the yellow note, which blends entirely with yellow. So we've got those. <coughs> so let's keep them there. And blue, he had to have blue, did he not? Because he was a clear seer. You remember how he gazed upon them and told them <coughs> their past and also their future. So he was a clear seer. So now we move, don't we, to that G note, which is blue. I'm sorry about that discord there. That's better. I'm going to have that one. That's three nice ones. So you've got three lovely notes there. So you have G, C there, which is red, E there, which is orange, and G there, no, sorry, the E there, which is yellow, and G there, which is blue. Three lovely notes, they're all in harmony, you see. Those are three very lovely spiritual notes. So you've got those three to begin with. Now, ladies and gentlemen, those are the three important spiritual notes. Now then, what are the colours in between? Orange? So we've got three notes there that can blend. So you've got the two notes which come together, which is the C and the E. Bring them both together, blend them. You've got the in-between one, which is D, which is the um, sun, the uh, orange colour. So you've got three notes that blend. Got to keep them absolutely separate, but yet they've got them together. And then look at the blues. Put the blue and the yellow together, and you have green. So we've now got from the combination of those five there colours, five colours, three colours and two of the colours between five colours, which are the same notes that we want you to develop. For mm -hmm. one, that we want you to find that strength, that power that loving, that caring, but the association with spirit. We can't find this great loving if you're using it only materially. If you're going to love everybody, uh, you're not going to do it. I mean, Jesus loved everybody, but he loved everybody spiritually, and that was the battle that he had. You know that, that was why Mary came along, of course, because he had to try and get over uh, loving someone for themselves. He had to love them because they had to be a sister rather than another. See the difference? Now then, ladies and gentlemen, he had to <coughs> master that. And then he had to put the, the, this lovely yellow, the mind, the wisdom. You see, he needed that. He got the other, he now needed wisdom. And then, of course, he needed the blue 
to be not only spiritually inclined, but to have that uh, intuitive uh, de de development, to be able to sense, to be able to have what I, be, I call the clairsentience, where he was able to feel and be aware and to be uplifted by that feeling. And so he developed that once. And he developed the association with all those until you got all those. Now I put those together and then start again, you see, ladies and gentlemen, with your uh, lovely red coming up again, which it does, you see, with another uh, set of um, vibrations. But the red, with the colour that you've lost, just got with blue, what do you get? As it touches it, you get your amethyst, and as you deepen it, you get your purple. So what you've got to do then is to realise that your spiritual gifts must be maintained spiritually so that they are of service. And as you get them, you get the amethyst, which means to say you've got to use them for the right purpose. You mustn't use them for a selfish purpose, and then you get the amethyst. If you use them with the amethyst, and then use them for godly things, blend here upon the earth with the vibration. You are linked with life. Your soul is there. So your soul is linked with the whole tone of life, with all the music and the sound and the colour of life. So light pours through. And as it does, that's where it starts. The base here, ladies and gentlemen, and as light pours through, subtracted from light is red, so that this part of your body is the red, and this is the part of the living force. You then move upwards until you have your orange linked with the sun, your sun center, right there, solar plexus, where the navel is, open it up, it's um, there. What you see when people open up like that, it's like the dawn of a new day, orange, coming up, you see here, rich. What do you feel when anybody is unkind to you? It doesn't come here, it comes here. Why do you fear sometimes what happens? Your stomach turns over, does it not? And then you're very often sick, are you not? Yes. Yeah. You see, it's the most sensitive part of you. Why do we say to you, when you're sitting in a circus, stop folding your arms? Of course, yeah. Unfold it. Be natural. Keep up. Open up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now that there's a good. So we have this lovely colour of orange coming up, and then you've got yellow, which is just up here there, round about where the pancreas and etc. Et is, and then you move up to the green, where the heart is, all in the line there, you see, coming down, all responsible for each area, and then you get this lovely <coughs> blue, then you get your amethyst, and then you get your purple, and as they move together, you get this wonderful opening of light. So supposing, which we want you to do, is that from here, where you're beginning to develop this wisdom, don't forget, just in between your heart and here, where you've both got to brought them together, you've got this yellow ray. Now think about it. Because here, ladies and gentlemen, is your orange ray. Up here, you've got your heart, which is green, coming up there in between the, this one and that one, using them onto the spiritual and spiritual gifts you are getting now, these colours coming up all the time, ladies and gentlemen, linking them together so that they're all playing a part. And as you link them together, so it is that you begin to see this beautiful range of colours until they're all being used for the physical body and also spiritualised to do with yourself. <coughs> Three spiritual colors. Crimson at its crimson color, pure invocation, trying to um, love, no matter what love is, that spiritual love, and to have determination to carry on, no matter what happens, but remaining you, never trying to be only the development of you. And then you have this lovely yellow of the mind. And ladies and gentlemen, it's wonderful to know that here with the mind, the 
prayer thinking, tolerance, all the things that matter, come to us, there is the beautiful yellow ray coming around us, and then this lovely blue the spirituality, the sincerity, the loving uh, for all, the caring, that sort of giving, that quality of being at ease, putting people at ease, and having that intuition, that vision of seeing. So you're seeing right from wrong, but your wisdom is helping you there. So that you are able to see the things in which are right and keeping on with that path and maintaining yourself in truth to what you have. And those three colours, then all these others respond to it. You see? All respond to those spiritual colours. And yet everything <coughs> is being used. When you are developing, you are developing those colours on their richness. As you see, and you are holding your clairvoyance, and you're working with your clairvoyance spirit. So blue is coming all the time. You're on that level of where intuition and mm -hmm. these, uh, the spirit can work with you. And that is the one that where you're working with the clairvoyant, one sees happening this lovely blue coming out, which means to say that you're bringing out that quality of where the spirit can communicate with you on those two, on those levels. And uh, in trance, one would expect to see not only crimson coming up, but you'd expect to see this lovely yellow coming up, this gold, you know, beautiful gold coming up, where you're mentally and uh, spiritually in contact with your guides, and they are using you, and the quality is coming through. So you get this lovely radiance coming around you, and you see this lovely sort of crimson of deep love, just like around everything that you're getting shining out in its love. It's beautiful to see. Some of the great trans mediums was able to uh, show us this when they were working. And mediums would often go and watch them just to get this vision of what they could see. And they were just the three colours. And very often as it moved away, you could see the violets coming in or the purples. About the, the three main colours were always in operation the blue, the yellow, and uh, the red. If, if they turn their attention to healing, you'd find green coming up, and you'd also find this deep orange coming up. So that you get green for service, you're serving. You've devoted your life in service. And uh, there you find, ladies and gentlemen, uh, how these things work. And that's what we look for. We keep on saying to you, develop these powers, and they are the powers that come to you in the hour of your need. When, when you're depressed, the guides will come and touch you, and you'll feel elevated. They're moving you onto this level of tolerance and understanding. And they bring that. They touch you with these edges and with these loves. And they come only to touch you. There's no need to speak, you see. They touch you. As they do, they touch you with great love. Right over here. Thank you very much. Right now then, ladies and gentlemen, you can now, I hope, begin to see that you are the coat of many colours. <coughs> so like Joseph and his coat of many colours, so are you. So I want you to consider yourself as a robe, and these colours are like a mighty robe that you wear. Because <coughs> in your normal life, you come down to your normal aura, which should always be a very nice one, but when you are in contact with spirit, it's there you have a new robe. And these other colors come up to <coughs> show to us that you have changed from your material thinking and your material living into the spiritual one. And that's what you expect to see when you come into the developing self. My mother used to, when we started, expected us, she would never come in the room until absolutely hopper and she would open the door and off herself. And if she saw from spiritually that we were not prepared, she would walk out and say, I'll come back when you're ready. And not before. She would not allow. She expected you to be in meditation. She expected you to be in prayer. And that she should show. If she didn't say it, she wouldn't work it. She'd go out again. 
you're not ready for me. And that's right. You don't come into the circle to get ready. You come in the circle to start at the time. You're then ready. That means you're there five or ten minutes beforehand. Not rush in at the last moment and say, I need, I need this mother. That's, you see? Because you can't get ready. You're wasting time. Because if you start then, half or seven, it's going to take you a quarter of an hour before you are ready to do any meditating whatsoever. But you're not ready for it. So if you have to start your circuit at half or seven, it's difficult. Then move it to eight o'clock when it's not so difficult. As long as you keep it to the permanent and permanent thing. So that you do not have these problems. You only give an hour to an hour and a half to the spirit people once a week, and you expect miracles. Then if you want a miracle in an hour and a half, give them the whole hour and a half. Because that's your development. And if you're only on for an hour, do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, that you don't sit 52 weeks in a year, and you know you don't. The maximum of people sit is about 40 years, because you have your holidays, you have your Christmas when you don't go, and various other holidays, the times you don't go, you will have a rest. Work it out. And then you give an hour. So that's 40 to 48 hours you give in 12 months. And because you don't get anything, you think that you're not, you know, you haven't got it. 48 hours. And most of you forget from one week to another to do anything in between. Do you realize that a piano teacher or a, a, a singing teacher that's teaching the voice production, various things like that, will send you back. They would know instinctively you went, ah, oh, that you haven't learned anything. And when you played the piece because you hadn't practiced it, they would know. And they would say, well, my teacher used to hit me with a, a ruler, you know, a little ruler. And I used to be terrified of that. And then she'd grab my hand, you see, here, and uh, make it work. And she'd say, those fingers right. And I used to, why did I ever think? Of and we all had to learn music. Because my mother was an organist, and she loved music. And we all had to learn, my brothers and my sisters. <coughs> And we had to go, and I used to think it was terrible. You should get your thing. You have to get a little bigger there, you see, here. And, and look, you haven't practiced at all, have you? You know, you say, oh, no, no, I didn't have to have a little bit. <laughs> and she'd give you more work to do to see that you did what you wanted for the following week. And yet, in circle work, we let you get away with it. And it's the most precious work you've got. Because that's the gift that's highly spiritual. But you have. Give us an hour. And we say to you, give us a course of an hour each day. And you say, no, I don't want to do that. How often do you wash your hair? And how often do you go to the hairdressers? And how long does it take? I know people that go every week to the hairdressers. <coughs> she's shaking her head. You never see the hairdresser do it. You eat yourself. <coughs> <laughs> oh, she does. <laughs> right. Well, now then, ladies, you have to watch what you do, or what you can, what you can do, to give that stillness, training your body still. So that when you go to the circle, even if you're going by bus or even by car, just before you get out of the car, don't rush. Just do it gently. Tune your mind. And try to get yourself still. And when you walk to where you're going, from out of the car, don't bang the door. Do, do it nicely. Get your mind tuned in to doing things slowly and nicely. And don't open the door with a rush and bang the sound up. Keep steady, you see. Control your emotions. And it will help you very much when you get to the circle to get into the state that you want you to get into. All these are very good hints for you. It will help you. And if you practice it, you'll, you'll master it and be able to understand it. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I told you the three colors that are important, uh, which moves from the green, which green is the life force, it's the force of um, progress, it's the force of being able uh, to give some idea 
of what's going to happen. You've got a future, and you are living beautifully with it. And you are supposed to be uh, <laughs> the greens uh, of this planet. And if you've got green there, it means that you are of service. Uh, nurses, doctors, um, teachers, uh, philosophers very often have this view, especially doctors, dentists, people that are affecting health, um, people uh, that uh, are matrons of, uh, of uh, disabled homes and people like that, where there's disabled people or elderly people, usually have green in their work because they are the people that make good channels for happiness and joy. Uh, people that uh, uh, have lovely sort of places uh, for children, orphans and people like that. Usually the people that are the best are the ones that have grief. They asked uh, one of the uh, mediums to come along and choose a person. We would always choose the person uh, that has green in their book because they turn out to be very good. They make good healers too, because they're willing to serve. And they will put that trust. So it's a lovely sort of green. It's a beautiful green. It's not emerald or anything like that. It's, um, it's a green like um, a tree when it's uh, coming out into before it blossoms. So it's, you know, lovely. And it's a medium green. And uh, that's what you want to see. And that tells us that you are capable. You are capable of being a very good channel for the spirit. And they can use you in various ways. So that you could be a nurse or a healer, a doctor. If anyone was studying, for example, and they wanted to be uh, um, a, a, a good doctor, if they hadn't green in uh, their aura, they may pass their exams, but they won't be particularly a good doctor. They'll go on to something else. They'll specialize in something where they don't have to meet people. They'll go into the laboratories or something like that. Because they haven't got that something that's going to get them where they should be getting. It's all interesting, you see. But it's a study, a great study. So that we realize that everything is not by chance. Nothing's by chance. You haven't come into this world by chance. Everything is according to law and order. So you've got the spiritual law, the natural law, you've got all these blending together. And when I said to you, ladies and gentlemen, that science is important, that is why you have to learn in the, what I call stillness and the silence, to find that, that stillness and that quiet that is so alive that it's got a sound of its own. And anything outside that sound will disturb the real spiritual sound. Because all growth has its own music. You can't hear the tree, but if you could listen to a leaf of the tree, it would give you the sound of its own life. <coughs> Musicians have tried to find it. Probably some have. But they'll never really find it because it's a sound that's nothing to do with the sound here. And it's such a spiritual one that my brother said that when he was taken so ill, he could have heard a feather fall. That means that anything material, however light, he would have felt and heard it because it's opposite to the spiritual one. I do think that's beautiful. And you've got to understand that. And when you're working with the spirit, you have got to be the discerner of what is material, which is the feather falling, to that stillness that only the spirit can come across it. And you've got to learn how to discern that so that you can find that difference between one and the other. One is material, however light, and the other is spiritual, but they're entirely different sides. And you've got to practice until you've got it. And you've got to feel it as well. That wonderful moment of when the spirit has overshadowed 
everything you tear, and you're lost in it. And someone says, well, describe it. You say, how can I describe it? You can't. My brother said, the only way he felt the stillness was that if he, a feather had fallen, he would have hurt it. Now, how are you going to describe that? You can't. You've got to experience it to find it, to, 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 to know it. You can't say to people, it's like this, because it isn't. There's nothing like it here. So how can you relate it to anything here? The only way you can relate it is by saying, exactly as my brother told me, I could have heard a feather fall. Is that dying? And he said, if it is, I was afraid to die. Because that was more real than the feather falling. The feather was disturbing. The reality was that which you felt. Now, spiritualism, you see, opens all that for us. And we would have never learned the thing about this only through spiritualism. And that's what's got to go all over the world. And it can. Once we have mediums that I hope you will be, that will not come and say, we have all these no's, and they say, well, it doesn't matter. Of course it matters. A no is saying, in other words, it doesn't matter, it doesn't count. Of course it counts. Everything counts. Everything in spiritualism must be positive, not negative. Where have I gone wrong? I've gone wrong. Spirit can't go wrong. How can a script go wrong? It's a direct law. We are wrong. So we have to look at ourselves again and say, we'll not let it happen. We will do better. So you put it right. And you make yourself more positive. So it is important that we get you right. And important, ladies and gentlemen, all the time that you put spirit as perfection, which it is, it's only when it comes down here and we use it that imperfections come. Because we're not good enough to handle it. We've got to be prepared to make ourselves as good as they possibly can. And what at the end of it? The lovely words that come within, not without. The voice that says, well done, thy foot and faithful servant, come inside here. No outer voice. An inner voice. So you meet the point of where the reality, which is spirit, is that it's greatest in God. And God within you knows that you've done that. And you accept it. The blending of the two forces. So, ladies and gentlemen, I come now to something very important. I don't know whether I started with this, but I want now to explain to you how spirit comes in the spirit of music and the spirit of everything else. Spirit is within everything. And when a composer, a great character and a great ability, composes music, you know that some of the great music and the great concertos are being given to us and composed by composers who couldn't even hear, absolutely stone there. But yet they've given us the most perfect music. Aha. Let's go back. The sound of music that's opposite to the sounds here. Your ears catch the sound of the feather falling. But your spiritual joy hears the sound. Nobody else can do it, but you can. And these composers didn't need to be able to give us, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to hear the sounds. Their music was so filled, they knew what was C or C sharp, or whatever the case may be. They knew that instinctively, because the music on the soul was able to relate it here entirely as they wanted it. And even if you played it, they couldn't have heard it. But they would have been tuned in and could have said to you, you are wrong. Because they would have heard it spiritually. 
Now then, how is it done? Well, if you go to hear a very good orchestra, and I do hope many of you will now go to orchestra concerts. <coughs> And although you can get wonderful tape music, which is very good, it isn't the same. Because you lose the actual reality. You have to watch the conductor. And you have to watch every, um, every one of the orchestral um, um, instruments. You watch the way it all comes together. And you've got a feel. So you've got to be clairsentient, you see, feel the notes pounding on you, and you've got to let your mind build a story. And you've got to blend with the conductor, because you'll find the conductor will lose every sense. He won't even know you exist, just like we knew. We forget you. We have to come down to earth by watching you. But we have to try and look at you exactly as a conductor would. Because we are trying to build heaven and get the harmony so the spirit can come. And the more we can bring you into it, so it becomes more of a reality. The spirit becomes more real and they 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 impress themselves tremendously upon us. Now, once we realize that we can lose ourselves, what you want to do, ladies and gentlemen, is to watch the conductor and watch the way in which he takes the whole and brings it all together. Even one slight mistake that probably 90% of the people that are listening wouldn't even notice. If you found it, you miss it. There's something wrong. Because you feel it. And you know the conductor was aware of it. And so the conductor, the whole time, is keeping it absolutely together. And then watch your clairvoyance. And the whole will come together in the most beautiful colors. You'll find the richness of colors that come along there. You can very often get this like rainbow of color, all blending, all together into one magnificent color. And yet you can't find the purples, you can't find the yellows, they're all in one. And that's what the music is about. Every note that's been played has been played in harmony with the other. Look at the sounds on the piano or on anything. Every note has its own chord, has its own color. And put that all together, what are you getting? A mass of color, a mass of it coming across, vibrating to you. And if you are listening, if you are just sort of separated yourself from it, you'll never get it. But if you put yourself in it, you are part of it and you are being moved with it until you come, you're hypnotized by it. You're entranced by it. You're moved into it. You're part of the vibrations. And when it's coming to its crescendo, you're automatically moved with it until you find yourself as though standing up applauding when it's ended. You've done it. You've got right into it. And it's this inside you that's doing it. And you are linking up with that which is inspired. That music was already in spirit before it came here. Mm -hmm. There's no new music. Mm -hmm. How can there be? Everything's up here. The whole of everything is here. All this is coming towards you. And that is why the composers have to be people that feel. They are clairsentient. They have to feel, they have to sense, it has to come from inside them. And where is that coming from? It's inside. Where it is in the soul, it's part of the soul. And they're tuned in soul-wise to the music. They compose it. And the conductor has to find that. And good conductors do. 
and you know how to move into it. You see it until the whole is a blaze of color. It's coming to you all the time. It misses you if you're not in it, but it can't reach you. But once you have let it, it reaches you. Yes? No, it's just that uh, no, it's just that you haven't just at that time mastered the thought behind it. Mm-hmm. You've got to do is not only play it uh, yourself, but you've got to play it as you feel it. And very often you've just for a while got to forget what it's telling you. You've got to feel it so that you are getting the music to talk to you. Mm-hmm. In other words, let the spirit of it move to you, and then you express it in your own words. Supposing, ladies and gentlemen, and I, I want to put it to you, everything's the same. You see, I want you to, to realize that mediumship is like being a composer. You are receiving from spirit. Now you've got to talk about it. A composer is listening and it's not in music. They, 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 have you noticed they won't allow anyone around them? Mm-hmm. And have you heard sometimes what they do? They go out into the country, miles away from everyone. And they can even tune in to the whistle of the earth and interpret that to music. They can even tell us, can't they, how the water over is giving the music. And they will give you a beautiful piece of music has to do with them. Just rolling down the water. Have you noticed when they've done things to do with the sea and you can hear the waves? The music. And very often you might close your eyes and you know you can hear it as it dashes on the rocks. And yet you, know, you, you, you didn't know, but you then could call it. I'm going to tell you about um, an experience here. For me, you know, they paid for everything for me to go, and I thought, I will, I will, I will, I will, no, I can't go. You <laughs> see, you know, you are not, it's not just doing that. And I invited them here for a whole day, and uh, the mm-hmm. man was named Smith, uh, you know, similar to <laughs> Smith, well, strange. He wasn't the Smith, he was just a Smith. And he was the person that was the, I think, one himself the present or the something of the whole of the southern area of Mormon churches. And they're really very nice people until we got to polygamy. <coughs> he was telling us about this. And can you understand some of our people you know, in France? <laughs> <laughs> and they don't allow coloured ministers. I don't know whether you're aware of that. They were not allowed anyone has colours to be in his net. And of course this came up in a question, can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> I mean the nostrils were sending out flames like nobody. I was burned, I'm sure I was. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they answered it very well. But he happened to be a violinist. His wife happened to be a cellist. cellist. And uh, the man that brought him happened to be a pianist. So they gave us in the evening a concert. Are you here, Peter? No. Oh. Do you remember that? Did we have them in the sanctuary? No, we had them here oh, okay. in the hall. We did have meetings. The it took the lecture in the yeah. sanctuary, yes. But we had them uh, sitting right by the window there, and we were all in the hall, sitting round, listening to this lovely music. And I gave everybody paper. I said to them, I don't want you to tell them what the music is. At all. And they said, why are these things? And I said, well, do you mind if we have an experiment? I said, but a, a nice experiment. Not to check you to see how marvelous you are or how many mistakes you've made. I said, a lot of these people don't understand music anyway. But I would like them to use their partners, uh, and you know we do see things. I said, and you know Smith did, so don't argue about it. And so they smiled. We got on very well. I mean, we like being here. We, we really fussed them very well. And um, 
So I gave them all a piece of paper, not them, but all the people that were students. And I said, I want you, when they play that piece of music, to write down, if you will, the colors that you see. And I want you to tell me whether it is a uh, love story or a story about a particular kind of life or has it got some philosophic um, meaning behind it. Well, could you imagine trying to listen at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> it was very interesting to watch. And you could see other <coughs> Spent on colour, 
and uh, vibration and music. So that uh, anyone that wants to study music and relate it to mediumship would be able to do so. So it's another course, you see. But if next year's will be much better than this year's. This year's, it's a practice. We should probably make a few mistakes. But uh, I'm sure that eventually we'll get it right. But we've got to get mediums working with it as well, you see. A lot of mediums, like Maria Taylor said, I'd like to do a belly dance. And I said, no, you've not. Maria, <laughs> <laughs> you know, she turned around and said, um, uh, and I was going to be a baby in the wood. She turned around and take notice of him. Because we've just been having a little talk about it, you see, here. And I had said to her, heaven knows what we're going to do with you on Symphony of Spirit. And she said, well, you know, I've always been this big. I said, well, all you need to do is turn around a few times and let all your facts as it wobbles take this bits of music. <laughs> so she said, and I'll do that as well, you see. Because she's very good fun. <laughs> so I said, well, and of course, Jill Holland is a very great friend of mine. She's marvelous. She's got a wonderful singing voice, as you know. Mm -hmm. So I said to her, you, you know, I don't think you're on the right track at all. I said, I want you to learn how to come on with uh, handbells and two big things here, <laughs> and a trumpet and everything else you see here. And I said, and you'll come and say, anybody know Bill? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, and when it's Tom, you do that. Tom, anybody know Tom? <laughs> She said, do you really want me to do that? I said, well, it would be good fun. <laughs> so she wrote me a marvelous letter that she was going to come on with a drum. She won't do it, of course. I mean, a, uh, a drum. She's got her brother uh, is going to find her a drum. And she'd got these, bell, these plate things like that. And she was going to do it. And she's going to have another drum there. She's going to say, Anybody know D? D. <laughs> and I can imagine her doing this. She's going to be great now. But she's so, but she's so funny. And she's so witty. So you can imagine. I think it's going to be one of those weeks we shall never forget. <laughs> but it's the idea is the change. You see, the change we're trying to make. What we're trying to do is to get our courses now more advanced, there's too many courses, bits of this and bits of that, that are getting us nowhere. And what we need to do is to get them all sorted out so that we've got a range of them that will follow each other. You see? So I feel that on the symphony, um, the symphony of spirit, we can deal with colour, we can deal with music, we can deal with sound, we can do with various, especially clairsentry. Here. I think we can really get to send him uh, uh, coming very, very well. We've got our healing ones, as you know, that we've done this year, that we're repeating next year. And in the, those particular ones, we have got alternative medicines working with us. And we had the most marvelous week, one of the best weeks I can remember. And we had specialists here uh, doing all various things, and they work on the children. So what we're trying to do ultimately is to, which I hope will happen one day, is that we will have our own hospital so that the spiritualists can have their own treatment using alternative medicines because they're very important as we do. So that we don't say we can do the lot, we can't. We must do, use everything else as well. And uh, so the idea is that we're moving away from the sort of uh, things of the past and now moving forward so that we're getting more specialised training, and uh, that I hope you'll enjoy. Now you see why I have brought this up in here, because it's part of all development, and sound is something that you will understand. And I think sometime it would be lovely for us to um, have our own um, sort of concerts or arranged concerts so that we can specialise and get our people that are interested to be able to come and see the spiritual side of music as well as the listening to it in the normal way. And I think if we can begin that, we should draw people that are musicians along there to see it and to hear our side 
And I think gradually, because they are very spiritual people, and should be, and must be, I'm sure, I think they'll move closer to us. Why do so many singers are spiritualists? And why is it so many actors and actresses are spiritualists? How many, when you realize that many of them have come to us for sittings, will tell you that when they were playing the part of someone that has passed over, that's a real person, they're playing that part, that they very often feel the presence of that person. And it brings them into spiritualism. And it's because they've created that situation where that spirit can be there. And they do, they become clairsentient. See how important clairsentience is? putting it in this correct place. Whereas people say, I'm not sure, because I don't know whether I see it or not, but I feel it. And they say, I could be my own mind. Now our clear sentence, as we're just teaching it now, explains that it is a gift to be able to do that. And that if you do it exactly like that, it, you can perfect it. Now, are there any questions, please? Yes? About color, is it not also that color is something personal? What you feel in, in green, for instance, doesn't uh, necessarily to be the same as somebody else feels in. You mean if you if you like the color, are you saying that? Well, the color is green. <coughs> you always have the feeling that green is the color of balance because everything in nature is green. Well, yes, it so it is. Yes. But for somebody else, it can be something. No, no, no. Green. No, green. Uh, you can put balance into that. Uh, yes, balance will come into it. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, harmony. And um, uh, if you get the right balance with any color, you'll, uh, you'll get the, the medium color. Um, it, you see, green is a progressive color because it's a color of life. And that is why uh, God chose to color our earth with green. And therefore, there always has to be green. You always have to have green. And it is a very soothing color if you um, do it. As long as you don't have the dark green, you see. It has to be this living green. And um, it's soothing. And the people that have it are usually that type of person. Very soothing. Uh, got a very good bedside manner, which I said. Usually the good nurse that also keeps you happy and gives you strength. And uh, that is it. If you're thinking of balance as sort of keeping a balance, um, the green gives that feeling to you, then that is correct. Uh, you can describe what green does to you. But it has not to be, you've got to just say which green it is, not uh, sort of say, I don't feel happy with green, and then show them a dark green. What about the lighter greens you see here? And people very often like red, will go for red and say, oh, I can't stand that color. And then when you say, well, choose of those colors, which is the one you dislike, and they choose this red. And you say, well, you should dislike it, because it, it, that's the impression that that color should give you. Therefore, remove it if possible, and play, replace it with something else, you see. Um, I must tell you a very true story. I mean, it is, um, um, I'm one of our millions that was here, and I trained them all with color. And, um, I said, look, the easy way I think we better do it is um, we better go and buy some ribbons and get the right colours and say to people, choose some colours, you see here. Well, it so happened that one of our young mediums had said to a person, choose me, she said, um, black. <laughs> well, you can well imagine. Uh, he was horrified to see that they uh, had uh, chosen black. And he said, no, I don't want black. She said, well, I like black. So he said, well, you can't have black. You've got to have something else rather than I don't want anything else. So there was an argument that came out. And, uh, he was such a nice uh, young man <coughs> that uh, he, he didn't let it get away with it. But he said, well, put black at one side, you see, here, for try another. Lemon sorbet. Now, <laughs> could you imagine what he was like? <laughs> lemon sorbet. She says, you haven't got the lemon I want there. I want lemon sorbet. She said, I don't even know what lemon sorbet is like. So he said, choose one of the... <laughs> no. And then came the next colour. So he said, now what colour do you want next then? 
blue rinse. Now, I don't know. <laughs> blue rinse? <laughs> she said, yes, I like blue rinse. So, he came to me, you see, when we had these sessions, we meet to discuss it, you see, and see how everybody went on. So he said, how do we get on? He said, uh, she's made up her mind she wants black, and I told her she couldn't have it, and so she wants lemon sorbet. I always said, yes, lemon sorbet. And I said, what did you tell her she could have then? So he said, oh, well, I told her she got to have yellow, and she said, I don't want it because I don't like it. And so he said, well, you've got to have it. <laughs> so when it came to blue rinse, he said, I was nearly at the end, so I had it for about a quarter of an hour, arguing over this black and this white and this sort of thing you see here. And she said, well, let me have grey. He says, no, you're not having grey. I've made up my mind, I've got to be very strict with you. <laughs> so you can imagine what was going on between teacher, uh, tutor, and pupil. Nevertheless, and student, um, the next time he came down, I said, I don't know whether I got the right ones. I think you must give me all the wrong ones. <laughs> so I said, well, now what's happened this time? So he said, well, I've asked one of the ladies uh, to choose from all these colors. <laughs> now, I couldn't have got one. He must have had about 50 colors there. So all different shades. of pencil. still a lot of time on getting them together. And he, he put them all out and said, now, I want you to choose one of those. So she said, You've got to give me three of those. She said, I'm not giving you three. So he says, you've got to give me three. He said, I don't want three. I only like blue. <laughs> well, it isn't what you like. What you draw to? I only try blue. <laughs> so, <laughs> he gets blue, you see. So he says, all right. And he's supposed to assess her on that. How can you assess, you see, a person on one blue? Anyway, they then had uh, a time when they were going to have in the group concentration on colour. Well, this lady was getting on. I mean, she was nearly 90. <coughs> and she still wanted to be a medium. <laughs> and she came to me and she said, um, she still wants to be a medium. Will you, uh, you know, assess her? So I, he said, I don't know where to begin. I can't say to her, no. You said, but I'm sure she's too old. So I said, well, let's find out how old she is. And uh, he said, um, anyway, he said, well, you see her. So I said, well, yes, but uh, try her out still. So they were having this. And um, she was to <coughs> go outside and then come in. And they were going to send color. Now, he t she told, <laughs> told him that she loved blue. And so he said, now we'll think of blue. She's bound to get that right, you see it here. <coughs> so there they were concentrating on blue, and she comes in. And she said, I don't like parlor games for one thing. <laughs> 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 so he was trying to be very helpful. She's passed over now. Nevertheless, um, <laughs> there's him. So he said, now, Tell us what colour you've got. Well, I thought to myself it could be blue, but I thought, no, they won't give me my colour. They'll make it difficult. I bet it's red. <laughs> <laughs> he said, why didn't you stick to blue? <laughs> so she said, well, I only like blue, and I thought they're bound not to put blue on. <laughs> so it's about to be another colour, so I thought I'd better give them red. Well, he could never get it right. The next time he thought, well, I'll give her red. You know. And she got blue the next time. And then another time, when he decided to try out again, he said, look, I think we'd better, well, have blue. You'll never guess what she said. Dusky pink. <laughs> Dusky pink. You can't win, you see, with a lot of these things. Nevertheless, ladies and gentlemen, it's a question, you see, that these are the things that we are trying to do to make it. And I must um, also tell you about this uh, lady that wanted Blair. She used to come to us and say, have you read that murder? <laughs> <laughs> Which murder? 
And then she went through a hole, she and she said, Stoke on Trent, yeah, she went to the wall. She, she said, in Stoke on Trent, she said, you know, there was that murder of the Black Panther. And she, her son, she spent one holiday, her son taking her to all the places of where there'd been a murder. So the medium came up to me, it happened with Gerald Smith, and Gerald Smith came up to me and said um, uh, to me you know, about this, he said, um, She's, she loves murders, you know. And so I said, well, that's why she likes black, is it? So he said, it must be. Every time she, she, we ask her a question, if you tell her about a murder, she puts her hand up because she knows every murder that's gone. <laughs> <laughs> and she spent a whole holiday going around. So when he asked her which color she loved, she loves black, absolute black. And he kept saying, but more from black. No, I like black, you see here. And of course, she was so full of murders. I mean, she's followed every murder right the way through. She could tell you how long they got, who was involved in <laughs> She's just had time. So she's black through and through. She is. <laughs> anyway, we do have our fun, as you can well see, especially with uh, some of the dear old ladies who come along. And they will have a good time. <laughs> No, there's no more than any questions. What are, the kind of, what are the kind of gold? Gold? Yes. What yes. is that? Well, gold? it comes under the yellow ray, actually. Uh, what we call the yellow ray, but it's really gold. Um, the gold is the refined part of it. It's, uh, the gold is the, the high spiritual color of wisdom. It's the, always comes to intellectuals. It's an intellectual color. But it's a very spiritualized color. It's a color of a reader that studies and wants to study and study for it for his uh, wise content rather than anything else. And um, a person that's very trustworthy as well and um, very agreeable. You, you can have a reader, but not necessarily someone that has the other way. You can have a person that studies, but doesn't study for the right purpose. Now, when you get um, uh, someone under the gold ray or comes under the yellow ray, not only do they make uh, very good healers, because it's a very good healing ray as well as this girl, and because it's very good for the nerves, very good, and um, it's very helpful. But it's a spiritualized color onto a very high level, and usually trans mediums, and people who very inspire get there. If they're a pure inspiration, uh, then you get yellow with blue. So over the top you may get a very faint green. But the yellow and the blue they must have. And uh, they're kept separate because it's better to keep them separate. Um, so that uh, the blending of it doesn't go immediately into green, which will take you away from the two real colours, which is yellow and blue. You must maintain those all the time. Uh, and let them blend on their own for further development rather than part of uh, just blending. Right. Yes, gold just comes out of what we call the yellow ray. And it doesn't, we don't call it the gold ray, they always call it the yellow ray. <coughs> but it is gold. What about silver? Sorry? What is silver? Silver? Yeah. Well, silver uh, is outside what we call the range of colors. It comes under a, a light color. Usually a person um, that is tuned in quite well. But you definitely get it more from the spirit than you get it from an individual. Um, silver from the spirit means someone that um, has moved into a highly um, illuminated um, presence. In fact, he said you could see silver in the Yes. And usually, as I say, it is an evolved. It's usually a spiritual light, what we call a spiritual light, rather than a ray that can come to you and I. It usually comes with someone in spirit. You can get guides coming under what we call a silver ray. And very often they've been called that. They've come and said, my name is Silver Ray. And you, we are well three or four guides that came under that ray and choose me a spiritual one, from spirit more than from here. Right? So you then have to interpret it from the spirit side as the spirit light. Because there are spirit lights besides the order lights. 
Mm-hmm. Which are separate from the reward. And silver is one of those. Where is my passport? Yes, my passport. Sorry.